Welcome to the Two Month Review, the weekly podcast brought to you by Open Letter and 3%, in which we take one book, break it down section by section, talk about it, analyze it, have fun. This season, we have been doing Monster Human by Shersti Skolmsvald, which I think we're pronouncing somewhat correctly, but we'll, we'll check, um, because she is here joining us uh, live to talk about Monster Human. And I am Chad Post from Open Letter Books, joined as always by Brian Wood, author of Joy Time Killbox. Good morning, Chad. Good morning, Shersti. <laughs> So are we, uh, yeah, I hope we're pronouncing your name correctly. We're yeah, you are. It's very good. good. Yeah. <laughs> so like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's the part, like, we're today we're going to go over the very end. This is the last episode of this season. Um, and there's a part where you say that you started to like your name when you learned how to pronounce it correctly. And then, uh, <laughs> and then, you, and then Hilda made you like the second, your, your Anna's daughter. And then you start to like your, your last name as well in this chapter. So... Yeah, because I had to see a speech therapist to learn how to pronounce my own name. And oh, I really? Thought, yeah, yeah, because the first sound is quite difficult for people. Yeah, and then you have a sound that's almost the same, which is S-K-J, and that's out here. Uh, and then yeah. it's back here. So, yeah, <laughs> but now I like it. Nice. <laughs> it's a very nice name. <laughs> Oh, thank you for joining us. Like we've been uh, talking about, I feel like we, we, like you said, Brian, like meeting a celebrity, it's sort of like, we feel like I sort of know you because this book is so, feels so personal and so like uh, close to like your mindset while you're writing it. And um, I wonder if that's like part of that, like fallacy, like an authorial fallacy, like we're just in, we're just pretending this is you and it's nothing. You're like, no, no, no. My, my writing experience is completely different. Or if this was like a very honest uh, assessment of what it was like writing your first book. I want to, I want to be honest. So I hope that it is. Uh, and I like books where I sort of feel like I'm inside the writer's brain, but it's not mm -hmm. like someone is showing me something. I just, Get to take part in it, of it, but there, I mean, there are some differences as well because a character, no, a character in an novel is always something else than a human being, and I, I think it gave me sort of a bit of freedom as well because everyone looks where I'm pointing at Chesley, and then I'm sort of free, and they think that, yeah, but oh, but. Of course, you know me in a way. <laughs> that you wouldn't have if you didn't read the read the books yet. Yeah, there was um one one line that stood out to me at the end. I'm not sure if I'm gonna find it right here, but was where no, I did um that really stood out to me and that seemed to mirror my experience of reading this book is on 427 where it says, I'm going to write a novel that by a change in the language proves that a person can change. There will be a development in the language from a halting, stuttering, strenuous language to a more literary language, prose that smooths out, reads more simply and clearly as glass so that through my language, I'll be able to show the development in myself. And that I really like, and that was sort of what, when we started talking about this, like they felt like there was an intentional evolution of like the writing style from section to section and different things that you're doing at different points in time, such as like, I forget where it was, but early on when um, you talk about changing the novel they are writing into a third person from first person, how it doesn't work quite so well. And like in Monster Human, that section becomes more of a third person section and it gets a little bit further away from like the honesty and directness that that makes it so charming. And it was, it, I think it's a really interesting technique and it was very well done throughout the whole book. Yeah. Again, not a question. <laughs> <laughs> I suck at this. Like, I, this is like the, no. I'm horrible at interviewing people because I'll say shit like that and then be like, nah, there's no question there. Yeah, well, I do the same, and, but that's, but it made me think of things when you said that. And I was very concerned with how people can change. I remember we had the teacher in the writing academy and she, uh, she was very, she believed that people cannot change, and I... Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's how she writes her novels, that people yeah, really yeah. don't change that much. And I can understand oh. that, but writing my first novel was an experience of how much a person can change. And that's mm -hmm. what I wanted to do in Monster Human, not only to tell the reader that 
the person changes, but to show it in the language. Because well, Regina Wolf writes about this, how affected um, we are by illness and how it changes the way we think and also the way yeah, we speak and write. And so to be able to show that transformation in the, lang in the language of the person was... But I, I don't know if I thought about this uh, in the beginning or if it was and um, if it was just lucky that it happened to be this way or uh, if it was something that I saw later on and then was okay well I pretend that it was I have, I have a I have a really practical and probably and probably stupid question but did you write um, the faster I walk the smaller I am <clears throat> then start writing monster human and sort of recreate what you were going through at the time that you were writing that, or did you write them concurrently? Well, the beginning of Monster Human uh, in the basement of my parents, yeah. as I call it, my father says that I have to stop calling it the basement because they have, they have the whole ground floor decorated for you, he says, but it's more literally the basement. <laughs> <laughs> and it was my mindset at the time, so it and it felt like a bit uh, And I wrote, I kept a journal. So that was sort of the um, beginning of Monster Human, human that journal, and I think, yeah, um, yeah. So I had written quite a bit while I was ill, and then used it when I started writing Monster Human. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting, Brian. You're gonna ask. I don't want to talk over top of you. Oh no, I'm just, I'm just wondering. You're always trying to like guess and figure stuff out, Chad. Did you have any guesses as to who is the French author that went to Romania and became yeah, a better writer? I do. You know, uh, okay. Dimitri Sibineag is the person that I thought it was referring to. It's <clears throat> about the French writer. Well, you talk about how um, John says, so <laughs> obviously, obviously you know this. Oh, sorry, yeah, it's, it's something so uh, obviously, John. Yeah, that. you know that I used to work at Delk Archive. In yeah. fact, I think we met, um, and I think we met and it reminded me in this book that we may have met before. So there's a question. So when you when you talk about going to meet um, English editors, Chat, don't don't worry. Chat has a very forgettable face, so yeah, don't worry about yeah. it. Yeah, you know. <laughs> he used to not have a beard, so it's a big difference. Um, so you mentioned going to meet the English editors. Were you part of the Pen World Voices Festival in the, New York? Yep, yeah, Pen the Pen Festival. Yes, yes. And there was a party, there was a, a breakfast brunch at the Norwegian consulate. Yes, you were there. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. We were I, there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The were, second I read that, oh, I was like, yeah, holy I, shit, I was yeah. at that event. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes, yep. I mean, like before. Oh, yeah, I, re I remember you. No, you don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, <laughs> No, but I, I figured that, like the second I saw it, I was like, oh my God, that I, this all, it all like locked into place. And it was like, <laughs> I remember so vividly now, like that moment, because I remember they had like, they had like such a, they have such a nice consulate in New York. And I remember they introduced all the authors who were there and you're all standing in like a line, like yeah. uh, up near a stairwell. Like I remember it very clearly. And, um, and it, 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 it occurred to me that that was you. Yeah. Yeah. That was me. Yeah. Um, so. But anyways, the thing that Brian's talking about, so when I was at Delkey, the, I, I know John, so which interesting, it's been really funny to see John as a character in here. Um, yeah. <clears throat> for, and I, I'm sure that he would, if, if he probably will never hear this, but if he heard this, I'm sure he'd be okay with it too. But yeah. it, it's funny to see like you be so honestly describing him in a way that like, I think he would be embarrassed by if anyone else were to describe him, like honestly in like a way you do it in the book so beautifully and so like generously, but it, that it's, but it's funny to see like someone else like describing, like you say, like, I really like when he's sarcastic and things like that. Like, like, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering a bit about what he would think, but he's been, well, he's, he has a good sense of humor, so. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but there's a part where he mentions that an author um, moves and starts becoming better at writer. And I, I, I it, there's two options. It's either um, Sip and Aig reminded me of it, or the other option is that there was um, Patrick Orednik was a Czech author who moved to France. And oh, his, yeah. and he also seems to fit the same sort of thing that that same, that same idea that he starts to write better in like the new language. 
Ah, yeah, no, I forgot. Mm -hmm. Because this was some, I never read the book. Did I write in the monster that I read it? No. 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 Okay. No. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Ask John if, but, yeah. Oh, no, it just, yeah, it connects really nicely with that idea of uh, language changing you and growing. And I just thought it, it weaved in perfectly and seamlessly. But it, it, it's an unnamed author. And I thought, oh, Chad's going to, like, want to know who this is yeah he wants to know who everybody is so I, yeah. I just like oh this is great i moved right along and i'm like oh chad's gonna have to google this and waste a bunch of time on this and then <laughs> go down a wormhole <laughs> no that's not true um no i, I yeah that, those are my guesses but regardless i have um, a quick craft question yeah um so i i loved at the at the very 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 start um there's these just weird, like random single sentences that just say "but" uh, in the first in the first part of the book, yeah. um, and then at the end, um, it talks about like having no buts at the end. Yeah. Did you have to add in the buts at the beginning to make it fit, or was that you already had that in there, and then at the end you um, tied it back together? As I remember it, they came as I was, as while I was writing it, so, because there okay. was always a way of seeing it in another way, or, and it's also that part of mm -hmm. the language just being a bit hard to get in, or, yeah, so I didn't put them in afterwards, as I recall, I, I tend to think, yeah, because, <laughs> well, oh, I'm sorry, I, did, I cut you <laughs> off. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, I think writing is sort of making a space for mm -hmm. um, thinking or a place where I can think of things. And then I always tend to think about just what if, or but if you see it in another way or, yeah. So they, I think they came while I was writing. That's yeah. interesting. It's interesting. Did, <clears throat> yeah, um, I just love the way they it bookended so nicely. I really enjoyed the way, because they stood out as a, such a neat kind of stylistic choice at the beginning, and then they kind of went away for a while, and then they come back at the end where, uh, I forget the character that's giving the writing advice, but it's like, don't don't have any buts or whatever. And so, but that's how it starts, but it doesn't end that way. So that was really, really neat stylistic choice. Yeah. I admired quite a bit. I, yeah, I, I I said this before we started recording, but I love the voice of this book. Like your your voice in here is so strong, and it's so it's so funny and refreshing in so many ways. It's really like the thing that I appreciate most about about reading this was just being able to go inhabit that consciousness and that way of of thinking and like the flipping back and forth between like you've, pure you've confidence. Never, you've never said that. Why are you saying that now? You're just saying that because she's here. Before <laughs> yeah. you were saying. I guess we started it. We'll probably just have to finish it. We'll see how it goes. And then now all of a sudden, because she's here. Oh, I love the voice. The voice was so great. It's one of my favorites. But go ahead, Chad. Continue. Yeah. <laughs> I have said that several times. The, um, the humor is really, I really, really love. I love the way that, like, there's little little jokes that get in there. And the fact that it vacillates between, like, the overconfidence and the ability of feeling, like, on top of everything to like a more crippling, like, oh no, you know, I shouldn't write or I can't write. Like that, it feels very, it is very honest. It feels very honest. And I really appreciated that, just being able to have that voice as part of our, our reading every week. So that's just a nice thing. Um, The uh, one thing that stood out to me at the end for the ending, if we're gonna talk about that, was that I just finished reading uh, Against the Day by Thomas Pynchon and I'm a huge Pynchon fan. And so like anything that deals with like the four different ends of the universe is sort of a, uh, it's a little close to home to me where it's like, yeah, there's these different options. Like everything could just like fade into entropy or could rip apart or it could crunch back together or like that kind of like multitude of like possibilities in which you're not sure which one is which or which one's going to going to win out is very, was very, uh, last night I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm really relating to this at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. That was, I had to bring something in because I wasn't able to finish the novel because it could just, go on forever it felt like and uh yeah when you told me earlier that well you finished yesterday reading and i'm i just 
think about the end and I there's still one sentence that I wonder if I could I let out Ooh. and so yeah because I repeat myself in the last paragraph there okay. you never get to it. well I don't know you never get the ending that you want yeah yeah oh, yeah. yeah and then it says you never get the ending that you want and I liked it when I wrote it, but now I wonder if I should only have had it in my room. So that's what, seven years no, later, I'm still thinking about that sentence. But it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is, yeah. I mean, I, I liked it as the duplication, but uh, but I can see like where that's like a choice that you could, that you could totally keep going back over and over yeah. and over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I just realized how cruel that is that we're asking these specific questions about some like I wrote this like a decade ago, so I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'd like to actually open it up to something maybe a little bit more general. Um, mm -hmm. The things that I was really honing in on towards the end of the book, um, there's this wonderful kind of this versus that of like, do you want to be happy or do you want to be a writer or kind of like, uh, there's this uh, there's the uh, darwin versus dostoevsky or like life versus literature um well you can have kids or you can be a good author like which which one do you want you can't have both and like your your, your character kept struggling with well, like i'd kind of like to be able to have both yeah um is that something that you're you're still struggling with or have you found some resolution with that yeah i think it's connected with uh, the reason I started writing because it was um, a way of putting myself in a very different position because it was unbearable to be where I was and then so writing became sort of a way to keep the world in balance and it seemed very scary to me to not write and uh, because uh, how it was before I started writing was not so good. Uh, so then, uh, writing the first novel sort of uh, made me addicted to writing in some ways because I could have just stopped since, uh, because then I was tired and I was out in the world, but then I realized everything I wanted to do in literature and how a novel can be anything, and that's why I started writing monster human and um and then my and i sort of kept people out of the writing room and was always writing and uh this is something i'm <laughs> uh, writing about in my latest novel the child and where suddenly i let some people inside the writing room and um uh, yeah and these kids come and am i still able to write or do i have to sacrifice my writing for but uh so far i have been able to write and i thought before that writing is um that you learn the most about yourself just writing and there's mm -hmm. a yeah. Yeah, that <laughs> child. Yeah, there's the child. Hi. <laughs> On cue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then you learn a lot from letting people in as well, and you find out new things about yourself. Just both like falling in love. You think that it's about discovering something, someone else, but then you realize so much about yourself, and not just good things, but awful things as well, and. So I think um, it's good for the writing actually to live a bit more. Yeah. That's, I was going to ask you if you could tell us a bit about The Child, which is your most recent book? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and it is um, being translated currently by Martin Aiken for Granta in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. So people who are, are listening to this, you will, I don't know when they're bringing it out, but it's, it's, it's in process. Yeah. Um, but yeah, could you tell us a little bit about what it what it is? Yeah, well, um, it is uh, uh, it is well, it is this <laughs> the 
The narrator uh, resembles me in when, many ways that she's writing and uh, uh, scared of yeah, letting people in. But then one person keeps asking if she wants to have coffee and after five years she says yes and then uh, well, suddenly he li <laughs> he's living in her apartment and uh, um, yeah, so it's a love story but it's sort of like a it's that difficult not so things are yeah uh, and then and then these children are coming along first one and she imagines how this will uh, change her mind change the way she's writing and uh, she has heard that you're up at night uh, with the kids and she imagines lying there writing poetry with this new language that um but Instead, she experiences losing language, and all she's able to write is, and only crying and crying and crying. Because you cry a lot in the beginning, yeah. <laughs> and then there's this, when the, the second child comes, she has someone to tell the story to. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, Are you working on something new now? Yes. Uh, Yes, I am. Um, now the narrator is a man who is uh, well, sort of in <laughs> love's life, but life doesn't give him any love back in some ways. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so it's it's short, through more like my first novel, maybe. Um, yeah, but I'm still, yeah, I don't so, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot and make you say too much when you're in process of something, but but it is interested. It must be interesting, too, I mean, given the success that you've had, um, all the stuff in Monster Human dealing with, like, being a debutante novelist and, like, being part of that, like, that world of, like, having your first book come out and, like, all that. And now you're the successful person introducing introducing young authors to the world, or new authors to the world, which must be a, a, a fun and different sort of perspective. Um, well, I don't feel experience. Oh, well, I feel like that's <laughs> just every time I sit down to write a novel, I have no idea how to do it. It feels, <laughs> I don't know, like, how do you write a dialogue? It's like, uh, it feels so, um, Impossible every time, I think, um, and uh, yeah. So I, I feel like a beginning every oh. time something. Oh. Yeah, new and I want to challenge myself and do something that I haven't done before. Uh, but in some ways, it's easier writing in that you. I think it's easier to recognize when something is working. Right. When I'm almost uh, and not that it's not like forced and constructed. And right. uh, yeah. Um, so I guess it becomes easier in some ways, but it's still. It's still. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine. Brian, you can Is that relate why, to that. Um, oh, certainly. I just assume it's going to suck and won't be well received. And so then I just have the freedom, like, well, if it's going to be terrible, I can just do it freely, whatever. No big deal. And then be pleasantly surprised if somebody enjoys it. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's my, uh, t my negative way of going about the process. But uh, <laughs> write, write without any hope or despair. Just write. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And are you scared of writing bad? Like uh, me? Oh no! I, I'm I, I'm I embrace writing badly. That's just going to happen. So. <laughs> As, I was wondering though, um, you you seem to be very um, flexible with. I mean, your 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 first book being so uh, thin, I think, as you say in here, and then Monster Human being fuller, for instance, and then plays or are switching to being more fictional versus being more auto-fictional. Is that part of just embracing challenge that you kind of shift, shift uh, writings, the, the writing style uh, book to book? 
Yeah, I think it's uh, it has to do with what I'm writing about in some way uh, with my first book. Uh -huh. um, I think that the person had to be so old because I felt so old at the time and it became so mm -hmm. true. Uh, and uh, then the second one, well, and I just Notice that it changed the changed the text completely when I used my own name. Mm -hmm. And I read this sentence by Montaigne. I don't remember if it's in Monster Human, but that there's nothing harder and nothing more useful than self description. And so I just had to think. It's. I think I changed style and because I had to figure out what it is. Sort of. And, Writing about grief, I found that I got closer to it in poetry in some ways, and um, so yeah, I think it's about what I'm writing about. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. Did you did you work with Becky much on the translation of Monster Human? Yeah, I well, she, she translated the whole thing, and then I read through it and made comments and yeah so we had this exchange where we discussed things uh, yeah that's uh, so, yeah it's a, it, it, there's so many like uh, we talked to her last week and it was it was yeah. interesting to have like um all the different things that she remembered like trying to figure out solutions to and seeing yeah. that I think bouncing them off of you a little bit and like coming up with some sort of like the wordplay or the the times where you as a character, your character um, forgets certain or uses the wrong word and like the sort of puns that come up and like the difficulties of that. So I was, I was yeah, I was sort of curious if you were, had much involvement in that part of trying to, trying to help her come up with good solutions. Because it reads really well. The translation is great. Like it feels very direct, very like, I, on the page it's very confident and very clear, which that's is great. Thanks to Becky. So yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's and always a, hard with translations and because it will never be exactly the same and then to find a way that it's, like I said, like it's authentic still. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't want to ask you any specific questions about that because I feel bad um, now too. But uh, there, one question I do have, so in in... You've, you've written a, a few different types of books and we talk about like how you're, you're writing the, the new book from a male perspective. Are there any things that you've noticed in terms of Norwegian literature as a whole that over the time that since you published your first book to now of different trends that are, that have influenced you or that you, that are, that seem to be prevalent um, or that are of, in, of interest to Norwegian writers today? Oh, that's so hard because in some ways I tried to not uh be too aware of this yeah and just to like have my back against it somehow um but it's there are some things that's impossible not to notice like yeah with Knauskor and the whole uh focus on the autobiographical yeah uh, thing but um these discussions uh become so claustrophobic in some ways in Norway I feel like that and it's sort of a relief when you uh, are published in other countries and you don't have these the same discussions in the same ways over and over again right but, yeah so the trends and I'm not good at that and uh, other people would know yeah than I do I was thinking, yeah, the Kanaskar is, is kind of what I was thinking of too, because it's interesting. Those books are coming out, obviously came out here in the States and in, in, in English so many years after they were written. Like they're, they're then for Norwegian writers and for new Norwegian readers, like they're almost old news now. Like that whole thing as a trend of like the, that sort of like navel gazing Kanaskar bit of the, my struggle at least. Um, that's already been, I mean, that's been years now. So it's had its impact in a way. So that's why I was kind of curious if there's like the reaction to that, um, which seems like there's there's been some of, of like 
we don't have to be like Kanaskar anymore. He's he's done his thing. He's done his thing. Yeah. Um, but and is it true? I heard that it's sort of the opposite in the states uh, that uh, when someone writes something and calls it autobiographical, that it sort of has to be true. That like lawyers checking out whether this will <laughs> happen, while in Norway it's like a really bad thing if someone can find out that you're writing something that actually did happen. Did happen. Yeah, I mean, that shows up in that sixth volume of uh, of my struggle where there's a lot about like him publishing the first book and like the people from the family being upset and wanting to sue him and he's discredited their name and all that kind of stuff. I don't think for fiction here in the States there's that much checking up on things it's hard to like it's hard to libel someone in the states in a book that you say is is based on your experience or like somewhat fictionalized um the law sort of protects the artist in a lot of cases i think in the uk it's a lot easier to get sued for libel and to lose um which makes it a little bit more complicated but there it has been like i don't know brian you might have a better sense of this i know that there are like a lot of like people who have started writing more in the auto fiction vein, um, which has been around forever. Like French, a lot of French female writers that, um, were really proponents of this back some time ago and were really spectacular or are really spectacular writers. And it's sort of like become a different thing. But I know that a lot of American writers have sort of moved into that both for, I think, I don't know exactly why, but maybe because of the MFA, but also because of um, identity politics that writing like a sort of auto fiction thing allows you to explore that more often. But I don't, I don't think that there's so many people that are afraid of being, of being getting in trouble for like including real, real events. Um, if you do nonfiction, like that becomes a much trickier. Like if you're writing a book about Trump, like you better get have lawyers that check that out because you're going to get screwed somehow or Scientology or whatever. Like there's bad things will happen. Um, but uh, for fiction, I think like you can get away with anything. Like, is there a difference between say like auto fiction or creative nonfiction or narrative nonfiction? Like, are these just kind of ways of branding a, uh, a memoir that uses more fictional techniques? That's just open to anybody. I, I, I'm confused by it all. Like, I don't, I don't care. If it, if it reads well, that's interesting. I'm, I'm all for it. I don't really care. But I always think back to there's um, like Joan, Joan Didion caught a bunch of shit because um, maybe it wasn't snowing on the day that she wrote it. But she's like, well, to me, it felt like it was snowing and that's what really matters. So I'm going to write what it felt like for me at that time. And I, I think that's kind of beautiful and wonderful. But then there's these, you know, People that are like, no, on I looked it up, and on September 6th, 1973, it was 72 degrees in that area. There's no way it was it was raining or whatever. You made that up. Yeah. Okay, whatever. <laughs> They're kind of missing the whole point. But yeah. like, so I mean, I guess between like something like auto fiction or memoir, because I, I think with memoir you're trying to be maybe a little bit closer to the truth, whereas narrative creative nonfiction, like creative comes first, right? Yeah, and that's what happens, even though the, your own material may, might be your own life and your own experiences, while you're sitting there, mm -hmm. like, no, it changes, and literature always wins, so if it's better that it's snowing, then it's snowing in the book. So it's harder to write accurate, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't there? I've never read I'm, it, but isn't there, to... oops. there's that book oh, that I think ahead, that, I think there's a book that um, the Believer came out with not that long ago. That's like the art. It's not called the Art of the Fact, but it's about um, uh, I think it's John Degata wrote an essay for them in which like there are those things that aren't true. Like it was about a real event, but like he changes like the nature of the clothes that this kid was wearing, like when things happen, like move them around. And there's like a long, there's a book that was published of like a long discussion between the fact checker for the essay and between him and like where that, that rule lies. I forget what it's called. Um, but people listening probably, probably know exactly what I'm talking about, but it seemed, it seemed to address what you're talking about, Brian, specifically of like, he's like, no, it doesn't matter. This okay. is important. But when it's dealing with, um, in this instance, it was dealing with like a real like tragedy and they're like, well, in this case, like you're talking about someone who really did die, like maybe 
it doesn't it's not quite yeah. your place to like make that into fiction because it's not about you and so like maybe there's like some division between that too of like the the personal essay the personal auto fiction the, the personal nonfiction versus the creative nonfiction about like reality i was just um randomly not to talk too much but uh, i was in amsterdam with dubravka greshik who writes a lot of personal essays that are from her perspective and they're they're frequently ones about like her cleaning the cleaning the person who does her cleaning at her house or like things in her neighborhood and now that i've seen her neighborhood and been in her house like i have a different sense of like how much of that is like accurate versus not just sort of invented or like what she's created is much different than i thought before i got there <laughs> i just expected I expected all these like bulgarian cleaning women to be like in her apartment constantly telling her stories about their lives but it's not true <laughs> yeah. well, like to circle back to monster human it mentions oprah several times in the book which i always laugh every i just oprah's funny to me um, <laughs> uh which i cannot believe she picked it to uh, Tahanisi Coates book for her book club. Who knew? Um, was it Water, Water Dancer? Yep. But um, to go back to controversy, that Million Little Pieces book, was that a memoir when it first came out? Because it got torn apart because so, the fact checking came out and it wasn't true. It wasn't necessarily all true. So the story that uh, that I've heard that I think is like the widely reported one is that initially he sent that out as a novel and then a particular editor who I believe was, um, oh God, what's her name? She's super famous. She tried to do the OJ book, um, the If I Did It book. She was going to publish that. Uh, oh, uh, Judith Reagan yeah, yeah. Um, told him that it won't sell as a work of fiction, That, but if it were a memoir, people would want to buy it. And so they just rebranded it as a memoir. And then it became so popular that once that lie was already like out there, there's no coming back from it. And so then it was up okay. to like someone to be like, you know, you weren't arrested in like Cleveland or whatever. You were, you know, you never had this dental surgery that you're writing about. Like all these things like came out, but I think it was okay. like, initially it was, he wrote it as fiction. And then they were like, no, it's okay. sell better. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a little bit more deceitful, I think, than, than like a mistake or like, you know, I don't quite remember what day it was or if it was snowing or not. This seemed a little bit more like sure. plotted. And yeah, like, it's a little, yeah, a little more gray. A little gray area. I'm just wondering, um, Oh, uh, when when this book came out, how did they? Um, how did publishers? Did they just take it as one of um, kind of push it as a piece of fiction? Yeah. The monster human. Novel. Yeah. They put novel, um, and I think of it as a novel. So yeah. But yeah, I don't think they use the word autofiction uh, at all. But I use my own name, and I use. Yeah. Like real places. Yeah. And, uh, but, and well, in the yes. beginning of writing it, I was so scared and scared that I would write something that I couldn't. And, but then yeah. I realized that I had to just forget all about that and just think that I could write anything and um, change it afterwards. And then I sent it to people so that if they, mm -hmm. because I would rather know if they were mad before it was published. Yeah. After. Yeah. Yeah. Was any was anyone upset by anything that you said? Well, people they are so different. Some were upset if they if I didn't have their whole name there, and or, or if it wasn't enough about them, and, and others were upset. <laughs> <laughs> I had I had one writing instructor tell me like, don't worry about upsetting people. They're going to be upset if they think they're not in it. Yeah, <laughs> was the was the advice I got? Oh, okay. And wasn't it a critic who wrote that you can't, or a writer who said that you can't write about a needle like this one? Or I just happen to have a needle here <laughs> uh, without <laughs> a one-eyed man or some one-eyed person being convinced that you're writing about them? But, so yeah, it is. And some people are upset if you write about dead people because they can't defend themselves. And then they're upset if you write about people who are still alive because they are still alive. So it's um, yeah. impossible. You can't, you can't please anybody. No, no. Yeah, Ernest Hemingway's estate is gonna come after you because I don't think you actually talked to Ernest Hemingway at the bar, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, yeah. Most people took it very well. And, the, um, and like my mother, I write a lot about my mother and she was, she was just worried that my sentences were too long, that people would. <laughs> That's the, inter the interaction. Hey, hey. Is, the interactions with your parents throughout this are spectacular. <laughs> yeah. Th uh, thanks, Dad. Let's not talk about how I should write anymore. Let's just move on to something else. <laughs> that was one of my favorite favorite scenes in the book. Me too. <laughs> so spectacular. So spectacular. Um, I don't know. I don't have a good question for you. <laughs> you Brian, you ask a question. Um, I really enjoyed um, on in the book on page 411. I actually, um, so there's kind of like this theme that we've, we've been picking up on about um, kind of recovering humanity through the process of writing. Um, and there's a wonderful line on 411 that, um, there's this this agent that's called Agent Even, um, and Even says person. one of the most important. Okay. I know him. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then Even says one of the most important things that anyone has ever said to me about my writing. Um, you would have always written anyway, he says. I hope that you know that, Shirsty, that you would have written anyway. So I'm Shirsty without my illness too. I can write anyway. I have something inside me that is independent of the M E. Um, I, I just, I really enjoyed that, that brief moment that your character had there of, it, it's almost like this 400 page pursuit of, um, being something outside themselves and creating something and the struggle and the, the confidence, the lack of confidence. Um, and then, and then getting someone to, to tell like you, like you were meant to be a writer. You always would have been a writer, any, any path you would have taken. Um, I just, I just. I don't know I always like hone in when someone says like this is the greatest greatest advice or the one of the most important lines someone said to me um, for like someone like myself that's just kind of embarking on this this type of journey do you have like writing advice that you like to give to young writers or or something that you like to encourage writers with um, help help me <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I just. But like, do you have like any kind of nugget that you like to to share with people or encouragement like that you like to give to writers? Because I know we have a lot of young writers or translators um, that are that listen to this podcast. I'm just kind of kind of curious what 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 would be your encouragement that you like to give to other writers? I don't. Well, I well, part in Lansuri. Uh, with just what I do with uh, letting the character know in the present what happens in the future, that I sort of had to go, oh, writing it, writing Monster Human was um, uh, hard in some ways because I had to re experience things that I went through and not being able to write, for instance. And with writing it, it was possible to write it because I knew what would happen. I could go in there and tell uh, such data. But in four years, uh, your editor will let you know that it's uh, now it's it's done. And so it was uh, so much harder the first well, when I actually <laughs> went through it because I didn't know. But so. Well, you talked about Oprah. I'm a sucker for those. Like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can do it. Just don't give up things because I needed them really bad at one time. So, so I tried for four years by myself writing this novel, not being able to do it, sent it to publishers, and they didn't want it. And so. But I think that if it's important enough, uh, we will keep trying, and um, eventually, we, you're like uh, I'm writing about in my human about how my engineering studies helped me in the way that I thought that if I just kept trying, my brain would figure it out in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just about keep 
keep trying. And, uh, but also to read a lot was important. Uh, and to become a better uh, reader, to figure out how a novel can work. And with my first novel, I just needed this very small universe because that's really, that was all I could handle. So I could have like one person in this apartment and she could go to the grocery stores sometimes. And then being more confident in my writing and being a better reader, I realized that I know it could be anything, and that's why I started writing Monster Human. But I don't know if I have any good advice. I just, I, it, it helped just now you telling me again what Evan said because I had forgotten a bit. And I was like, yeah, that was very nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I really like the parts with um, the whole idea of how your first novel got edited and picked up, and like it feels like it was a very, collaborative process in a way that I'm not sure most writers have the experience here anyways. Like I feel like a lot of like my friends that are writers will send off their book and either it just gets rejected or like it'll get a nice note of like, we like this, but like we couldn't do it in the end. And like, that's the end of it. Whereas like your experience in here seems so much more involved and like inter intellectually interesting to me to like be like people be like, okay, yes, this is, you've got something, but maybe you know, maybe there's something more, I don't know what the, you don't reference the specific conversations, but it feels like there are conversations happening in which they're giving you different pieces of advice of how to improve it. And you just keep reworking, keep reworking. Um, and I really like that in here, like that, that feeling of like being able to have someone giving you feedback that's important like that, that's not just dismissive or just like, that's the end of it. Um, and that you just kept to add it and like, didn't give up and didn't just say like, okay, like, I'll move on to another book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I thought uh, before that when the editor calls, uh, it means that it's ready to go off to print. But yeah. it was two years of working with the editor and it was a long process. And it wasn't, they weren't just thinking about that one book, they were thinking about building a whole authorship uh, yeah. and all the next books uh, that would come. So I, have, I was very lucky with my editor and my and you, I mean, you got like the one of the best publishers in all of Norway is publishing your work, which makes a makes a big difference or is big is helpful. But I like that too that it was it does always seem like in the book and like you're saying that it was not just like here's a book we're gonna try and sell, move on. But like your career is something that they're investing in. That it's going to be all the books that come after this too that are of importance to them. Uh, I felt like they took it very seriously yeah. signing that book because it didn't mean just that book. It meant all the books that they, that should follow. Yeah, that's really cool. So when you say, um, as one of your pieces of advice that you should read a lot and uh, and or be able to read will help you be a better writer. Are there any authors that you who are the authors that you recommend? Who do you like? Who do I like? Well, um, oh. I think the ones that were most important to me when I started becoming a better reader was, well, Beckett and Kafka and Selim, like big names that I should have read a long time before, a long time ago, but that I hadn't. And, right. But now I'm, well, now, today, <laughs> yeah. right now I'm reading Dogs and Dogs, uh, uh -huh. and uh, and I think he's so, I think he's brilliant. He's, uh, yeah. And I'm discovering him for the which, first time. Which, which book of his is your favorite so far? Uh, a T, T Singer? Singer? Yes. 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 That's the one I taught in my class. And uh, yeah, last, last spring, because I read yeah. a few of them. And I, I'd read a few before, because um, there are a couple that came out in English some time ago. <laughs> But T. Singer, I really liked, so I taught it in my class last spring, and um, all this, uh, the students were sort of baffled by it, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's great that you like that, yeah. I They're just like, well, there's not like a plot. And I was like, no, the plot is that yeah. life is tough. <laughs> like, it's like yeah. existential, like, that you're, yeah, that you live and things happen and you can make your way through. And they're like, I don't know, I'm 21. Yeah, like, <laughs> life is impossible, but it makes you laugh, and yeah. Yeah. 
I loved it. I, I think that book is fantastic. Yeah. yeah I sure, Chad. I apologize. I have to go to the airport. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And I know that you have your, you have your, you, they you're going to be. for me any longer. Yeah. No worries. Well, <laughs> but, uh, and I know that I, we, I should, we should. Sure, Steve, thank you so much. This was such a enjoyable experience for me reading this book. And I, I took so much uh, inspiration from uh, seeing you overcome so much and your character overcomes so much in here. And uh, somebody that's like struggling every day to be an artist, this was so inspiring for me. So I appreciate it so much that you were so vulnerable and honest yeah, and inspiring okay. with this. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That means okay. it. Thank you. <laughs> and I know that you're going to have to get going too. So we can basically wrap up. Um, I, I we usually end with like a favorite quote, but I'm not going to do that to you because that would be that would be embarrassing to have to pick up a favorite line from your book. But I too also want to just reiterate what Brian said that this is really spectacular and it's been very fun to be in this world for these weeks and to talk about all the different pieces, parts of the book. I went back and reread Faster, I Walk Smaller I Am, and I'm really looking forward to reading The Child as soon as uh, Martin finishes translating it, which is great because he's a very, very, very talented translator. Yes, I know. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, yeah, thank you. And for anyone listening, you can um, know that the next season is starting next week. It'll be Ducks Newberry Port by Lucy Elman, which is a good, hopefully a good segue to go from like one character's mind into another character's mind. That's a thousand page uh, rant about society <laughs> and life. So we'll see. We'll be back next week with that. And thank you again for coming on here. Thank you.